Yeah, there we go. Okay, it's, it's asking me all kinds of questions, but we are recording. Welcome, welcome to Ted Reed of Ted Reed Productions. Uh, Ted, uh, great to meet you in person. I can't wait to get started and find out some of the things that you, that you have done. Thank you, Rick. No, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, I was just curious how I managed to uh, achieve the honor of, of getting interviewed by you guys. Well, first of all, we, we try to uh, check in with North Shore newsmakers as much as possible, and we don't we don't like to quote people. We like to use their interviews. We don't edit. We just want to talk and have conversations. And I, I came across something that was posted on some social media somewhere because I'm always trolling it for news tips. And there was a, a feature uh, of you uh, uh, applauding or lauding Martin Sheen. And that really caught my attention. So maybe we should start right there. Okay, that goes way back. Um... You know, I started off uh, working in television uh, when I was around, let's just say in my late 20s. And um, shortly thereafter, I was on a lot of TV commercial, you know, sets, uh, McDonald's and a few car commercials and things like that. And there was this woman who was always there. She was the uh, sort of lead producer from the main ad advertising agency that we were working for. And... You know, just, we ended up being the ones that were still standing at the end of the night. You know, it's three o'clock in the morning, you're wrapping up the last take. And, you know, she was, she was still awake and I was still awake. So we got, you know, to talk to each other and <clears throat> found out we had a lot of mutual interests. And uh, then we got a job working for a couple of TV stations together. And finally, we had an opportunity to create a documentary for Channel 4 about the history of broadcast television in New England. You know, an hour long primetime special. Who, who could resist that, you know? So we decided, let's, let's do this. And uh, after we finished the thing, it got good press. The managers at Channel 4 said, hey, listen, get yourself a company name, uh, letterhead, and we'll throw you some work. So that's basically how we started our production company. Wow. Uh, which uh, went on for like 35 years. Five years into it, we decided, hey, you know, if we can stand each other 24-7 like this for five years, we should get married, you know? So we did. And, <laughs> okay. And it was, um, you know, so the, the work actually, you know, started before uh, the, the relationship, but it was um, cool to do. We uh, expanded into doing stuff for CBS, PBS, um, Lifetime, Discovery Channel, all kinds of, you know, cable stuff. We did an independent documentary about a debutante cotillion in Washington, D.C., which uh, went to Sundance, and that was a trip in itself, and a few other, you know, high points along the way. Um, my wife passed away three years ago, and so since then, I've been, uh, you know, sort of battling it on myself, but one of the things that that taught me was, you know, it, it made me think about, you know, life is short, what are you doing with it? And what I wanted to be able to do was, you know, really make films that spoke to me in terms of just what I was curious about. Mm -hmm. And usually I found that other people are curious about it as well. So I ended up uh, following my, my dream really in a lot of ways. Um, just in the last few years to be able to you know, really explore some of the stuff that I really wanted to do. Interestingly enough, the Martin Sheen thing was uh, something that just fell out of the sky. Um, one of the um, heads of CBS uh, just went on an outward bound uh, school for, for like two, two weeks. Uh, he, he's a guy who grew up in Manhattan, had never you know, seen the stars at night and you know, he, you know, thought this was the best thing in the world, you know, sleeping outdoors and going on these adventures, tromping through the woods and stuff. And so he said, we got to do a film about Outward Bound. So we went out and did uh, five Outward Bound schools in one, what, six month period. I was in really good shape, I would say, by the end of it, you know, because it was a lot of, yeah, tromping through the woods, portaging canoes, rock climbing, all kinds of other stuff. And so, of course, you know, when the school was doing that, the class was doing it, we had to follow along with, you know, the cameras and everything. So that's, that's basically how that happened. And um, when it was time to uh, shoot, you know, we needed a host. And the folks at CBS had managed to get Martin Sheen to agree to say, hey, yeah, I will, I will do the hosting and the narration for this thing. 
but uh, we weren't able to take him off to an outward bound school, you know, because that would like mess up his schedule. So we went to Griffith Park in Los Angeles and found a vista of, you know, something that looks sort of deserty and put him up there. And in a couple of hours, we just did all the stand-ups that we needed for the show. And then the rest of the day, uh, we just went to a restaurant. Martin Sheen just sort of regaled us with stories of his career and things like that. So it was, you know, a great experience. One of the wonderful things about this business is you get to meet an incredible range of people, both famous, not famous, but they're all got interesting stories. And, you know, the, the, the tough part is to pick out which ones, you know, are you know, worth putting the years of time that it usually takes to be able to pull these stories together. So that's how I got to here. Um, I was living in Cambridge with my wife for a long period of time and then had the opportunity to move up to the North Shore. And that was you know, 30 years ago. And we were able to, you know, we found a house in Rockport, stayed there for a long time. And then just in the last oh, decade decided, well, let's move to Gloucester because there's there's some very interesting people there. A lot of the folks that we happen to know were from Gloucester. There's a you know, great artist community as well as everything else that's happening here. So we decided to stick around. It's basically my base. I go all over the world, really, but you know, I always come back to Gloucester because it just feels right. Well, and, and this is my Martin Sheen story. So the Martin Sheen is going to be Ted Reed. So I'm really, I'm really excited about this. This is so cool. You know, how did you first get started? Because, uh, I, and, and the other thing I want to get into is how the technology has changed and, and you've, uh, you know, worked yeah. along with it over the years. But how did you first get started? And, uh, you know, back then, I mean, uh, the, the stuff was so uh, cumbersome, the equipment and so on. And I'm sure it's uh, been scaled down now. But how did you first get into this stuff? Well, I was originally, you know, when I was in high school, I was... Uh, a, a working still photographer, actually. You know, I worked for the local uh, newspaper, covered football games and a few spot news things and things like that. I was always into documentary photography. And so I went to, um, uh, when it was time to go to college, I signed up at Rochester Institute of Technology. And um, they have a very, very complete technical background uh, preparation program where you, you know, learn about the physics of lenses and how to make your own film emulsions and stuff back in the days of film. And, but not a heck of a lot in terms of the creative side of it. So I transferred to uh, the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, which is affiliated with Tufts. And one day when I was um, down in the dark rooms in the basement of the school there, um, I ran across, there was this guy in sort of this dark room and he had a couple of reels of film that he was passing through a, a viewer. and. Um, he was, you know, sort of looking at his movie and he turned up and looked at me and said, want to make a movie? And I said, sure, why not? And he was one of the um, film history instructors there, but they didn't have a film department. So we decided, hey, let's, let's get some of the professors from BU and MIT come over and like guest lecture and whatever independent filmmakers were coming through town, we would, you know, bring them in as well. So we stayed one chapter ahead of the class and started the film department at the museum school that way. And then it was, you know, just picking up whatever jobs I could find that had anything to do with filmmaking. So I was uh, a lighting guy, I did sound, I did uh, sets, um, painting, you know, backdrops and stuff like that. Basically everything, anything that I could get a job doing which really ended up paying off really well for me when I became a director because I happened to know what everybody does on the set. And one of the things that that led to was working for a couple of TV stations. And yeah, the equipment was very, I would say primitive, you know, compared to what you can do now with, with your phone, you know, I mean, it's, it's just amazing. But back then uh, we used a, um, you know, film cameras, 16 millimeter film cameras. And you couldn't record the sound along with the picture, you know, on the same piece of film. You had to record that separately. So when you got into editing, there was the whole process of syncing up the picture with the sound. And it, you know, it was very time consuming. And, you know, and the kind of thing that if you can learn how to do it quickly, um, you can, you know, make yourself some inroads. And so I took a job at the uh, at Channel 7's news department for a while. And I ended up, you know, 
cutting breaking news and sports stories and things like that for your 11 o'clock news. And it's you know, really great experience in terms of working under pressure. So when um, it was time to do our hour long show about the history of broadcasting in New England, um, I was definitely up to speed. But I'd never done a, you know, an hour long film before. So my wife and I, my wife to be, and I at the time just sort of dove into it. And in essentially three months, we came up with this show that ended up winning an Emmy Award. So not a bad way to start your television career, you know? I, I would think, uh, yeah, I think you finally, you probably figured out you found your niche. Uh, so mm. I, I, I agree. And uh, it's funny when you mentioned learning all the, all the aspects of it uh, from the ground up. Uh, I just have to tell you, when I was at the radio station, I did the same thing. I cleaned the toilets. I emptied the waste bath. I did it all. So, but you, yeah. you picked up the technology and the creative side interests me, Ted, because um, it, it's, I, I don't know if it's rare, but I don't think it's that often when you can fuse uh, the technical aspect of having the eye that you have and having the creative uh, abil ability to create a story along, along with the technical, technical aspect. So the, the creative part, is that something that, um, that has been uh, nurtured or is it something you've always had? Total, well, I wouldn't say it's totally nurtured. I was always into writing when I was in school, and uh, I became uh, you know, the editor of the literary magazine for my high school, and you know, it was the kind of thing that I liked doing. I just liked telling stories. But in terms of getting my professional chops down, I have to give total credit to my wife, because she was a brilliant writer, and she would correct me all the time about, no, don't put those two words together, or this doesn't flow, or why is this just sort of sitting out here like that? And, you know, she would really, I mean, it was like, you know, going to graduate school for how to be a, a great writer. And, you know, I've managed to be able to adapt quite a bit of that into my filmmaking. So um, that's really where that came from. So I was really lucky to be able to have both the technical background and then, you know, the, the creative side of it as well. And that it, that's really what made us a good team is because, you know, she brought that to, uh, to the, the mix and then I brought the technical and, you know, visual you know, part of it together. And so that's, um, that was really an important, you know, learning phase of my career is when I started doing more of the storytelling. And she really encouraged me. She said, you know, here, just here's this segment that you understand better than I do. What's, why don't you just write it? So. That's how I got started. You know, I just got feet first. I think the, the idea of being published um, always feels good. And when you create something and you're satisfied with it, uh, I think there comes a point when you just say, okay, this is it, I'm done. Because I think we always look at something and say, well, maybe I could have done this or done that. On the one hand, so, so, so creating something that is yours uh, must feel good. But on the other hand, all these amazing awards, these Emmys, the Academy Award and stuff, uh, what does that do for for your? I, I want to say ego, but but I mean it in a sense of wanting to create more. It it certainly is, you know, encouraging. I got to tell you, um, the thing that's interesting about the awards, it's great during the awards ceremony and for like a week afterwards, you people contact you and say, like, "Oh, great, good to hear you're doing that," but it doesn't mean anything as far as what your next project is because your last project is what they you know, sort of judge you on and the awards for it are great, but what's your, what's your new idea? You know, what's, what's, what's next? And that really is sort of the crux of uh, being able to survive in this business is to continually have ideas. When we went to Sundance, we were exhausted from making our film. And so when it was time to get interviewed by the press that was all over the place there, we were totally unprepared. We had, we had no next movie. We, the, this one practically killed us. You know, why, why would we, why would we want to go through this again? But it was, it was fun because it was really, um, it, was, it really stuck with me that, you know, when you, when you have a finished film, you better have something that's already in the works because people want to know about it. And who knows? Someone that may want to fund it, you know, may want to talk to you as well. So what I was, what I would always tell any up and coming, you know, filmmaker is, yeah, it's great to have a movie, but make sure you've got another one if you want to do another one, you know, because it, as long as there's something in the pipeline, there's always another idea. So I, now I've usually got about three or four projects, you know, sort of 
getting up and, and running while I'm working on another one. So it's, it's, it's exhausting, but it can be, you know, also a lot of fun because you can really get into what your ideas are and really get into sort of the whole problem solving. How do I turn this into a story? You know, this sounds interesting. This person is interesting. This particular event is interesting, but is it a movie? And how do you make that something that an audience really wants to be able to follow and get something out? Are there things, are there things behind the scene, whether it's a documentary or whatever, that you don't use in the final uh, production number, the final, the final piece that you produce, but that uh, you hold on to for archives that you might use later? Or, or oh, that absolutely, it, absolutely. Uh, this uh, project that I'm wrapping up now is a, uh, something that was actually 50 years in the works. I, my very first film, when I was a film student, um, a friend of mine said, let's go down south and find all the old blues guys that we can possibly find that are still alive, shoot them, and then make a movie out of it. And that, that was, you know, sort of the, the, the extent of the pre-production that we did on it. So we just borrowed a camera from the school and got into a, his car and we drove down and found some of these guys and spent about, you know, two months just sort of driving around Louisiana and Mississippi. And then came back and that's how I learned to edit, you know, at the, at the, uh, at the museum school is basically putting this first film together. And then after my wife passed away a couple of years ago, I just, um, I, I looked at this old movie and I said, you know, this stuff is like Library of Congress archival footage. It's 50 years old. Nothing, you know, must look like this now. I wonder what it does look like now or what's going on down there. And so I went down uh, over the last two years with my cameraman and we just stayed in Mississippi and Tennessee and just sort of checked out what everything is doing. I mean, it's like the blues now is this giant industry in both Mississippi, Tennessee, and Arkansas. And there are museums all over the place. Muse uh, Mississippi has a blues trail with like over 200 historic markers. And so we did a whole ton of interviews and then a bunch of performances with interviews with the, uh, the performers themselves. And there's no way at all that I could use all of it in my film. So um, what I'm in the process now doing is sort of going through all the interviews and seeing what I can do in terms of structuring a podcast around all these, you know, I've got, I've got quite a bit of content um, that I think would be interesting to people who are into, you know, into the blues and into music in general. So that's, you know, one of the ways you can, you know, sort of repurpose stuff that you have in all your outtakes. And I happen to be very fortunate in this one. I had a lot of it. So um, I'm looking, and the thing is doing a podcast is not nearly the amount of work putting a film together because, you know, here's, here's the interview. Um, write up the questions that you wish you would have asked to get the answers that you got, and then just sort of, you know, put it out there. And uh, we've been talking with the Blues Foundation in Memphis about them possibly hosting the podcast on their website. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, you know, it's, it's be one of these things that, you know, you get an idea, you talk to people, and you try to get other people excited about what you're doing or getting them to see what the value is. And, and maybe, you know, if it all works out and all the pieces come together, you can do what you want it to do. So that's, that's one example of being able to repurpose this stuff. Another thing is um, I've been working with the uh, organizers of the St. Anthony's Feast in the North End of Boston um, for like 12 years. And this year they can't do the actual feast, you know, because of the pandemic. And they said, you know, it'd be great if we could just put together a virtual feast, you know, show the food, show the parade, show all the people and stuff like that. And I said, yeah, we've got, we got all this footage that we've shot and let's, let's put something together. So that's going to, that's going to be the, the weekend before Memorial Day and um, on the St. Anthony's Feast website, these things are going to just come up Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And so people who would ordinarily be going to the North End to celebrate the feast will be able to sit at home. Uh, we have a bunch of cooking demonstrations so people can, you know, make some of their own fa favorite feast food. And then we'll be able to, uh, you know, sort of see how many people actually tuned in to be able to judge was it a success? I mean, what's interesting with social media and especially with streaming media now is that you can tell exactly when people are starting to watch it, how much of it they watch, when do they drop off, do they watch the whole thing from beginning to end, and you get comments. 
you know, if we had been able to do that in the, our television days, it would have really helped to be able to say, okay, this is what people like. This is the kind of story that folks want to be able to see. We should do more of that. Are you enjoying um, this digital era? I am. I mean, what's been interesting about my career is that, you know, talking about the, the advances of technology, I've, I've seen so many changes, you know, being in the, the business as long as I have. Um, you know, going from film to then videotape and then editing videotape and then going to, you know, just tapeless, you know, just regular, you know, all digital media and then just distribution being entirely on the internet now. Um, it's, it's evolved in many, many different ways, but it's always exciting to be kind of on the cutting edge. You know, let's try this. One of the things that we, my wife and I did early on in our careers was, um, there was a show called Evening Magazine, which was also called Evening Magazine in other markets. But in Boston, it was uh, Evening Magazine. It was the first sort of local half hour video magazine show. Um, and so the, the idea was, let's find things that we can make stories about and we'll put them on. You know, so we had five nights a week that we had to be able to create all this content for. There's no rule book. You know, nobody knew. Here's what's going to work. Here's how you tell these stories. Here's how you know you should structure them. Things like that. No, it's like really make it up as you go along and see what works. So being able to be in a situation where you're kind of a pioneer has always been you know just sort of part of what I've done. And this is really no different. I mean, one of the things that's amazing now is that you can be you know, the entire thing. It used to be, um, you know, when you made films, there was the production process, fundraising process, um, distribution, and the rest of that. You can do it all yourself now. And the cost is ridiculously cheap. When we did our film that went to Sundance, it took us uh, five years to be able to pull together the funding. We were able to sort of edit it as we were able to get the film, pay for the film to get it out of the lab. You know, so in fits and starts, we're able to do it. But now, for what we spent on that film, we could have done, you know, probably a half dozen films just shooting on digital video, editing it ourselves, and then distributing it on the internet. Wow. So it's, um, I think it's opened up a lot of freedom. I think it's also encouraged a lot of filmmakers who maybe have ideas that they thought, well, no one's ever going to pay for this, but because it's so cheap to be able to do it myself, I can do it. Documentaries especially, you know, because you can, you can shoot a documentary with your phone, you know, there's, there's nothing to stop you now. The quality of the video that comes out of some of the latest, you know, Apple iPhones uh, really, you know, challenges uh, the kind of quality that we were getting with cameras just five years ago, you know, and that was before, you know, 4K and ultra high def and stuff like that. So it's, it's absolutely astonishing what you can do with this thing that's just sort of sitting in your pocket. Not that it means you can abandon the idea of having a story or interesting characters or stuff like that. No, those elements still are absolutely necessary. But in terms of the range of topics that you can get into and where you can go to make your movies, I think it's you know pretty exciting. I made a prediction uh, a while back, 10, 15 years ago, uh, and I, my question, I, who would ever want a phone with a camera in it? Who would ever want that? And so now you have to have one. There's a camera, right? Oh, it's ridiculous, yeah. He's, uh, it, what's his name there? Uh, Jobs has made me want something I didn't want to want. Now now I have it. Yeah. And I, have a, I have a couple more uh, questions. Um, I want to ask you one. I want to ask you correctly. A lot of times you see people, uh, they'll, they'll ask to me uh, on TV the stupidest question, what's your most embarrassing moment? I would never ask that. But what I would like to ask you, have, have you had failures, and I don't need to know what they are, that you have really learned something from and you were able to maybe, I don't know, change your method, get a new piece of technology or something like that, something you thought was going to work. It mm -hmm. didn't, but then you were able to, to get it to work in another way. Sometimes. I mean, yeah. I mean, the, it's, especially if you're, you've got a new piece of equipment, you know, and you've for some reason, you know, the, the client said, OK, we got to use this camera and you've had like maybe 12 hours to figure out how the camera works. You, you know, either make it work or <laughs> you don't, in which case, you know, the whole thing goes down in flames. So it's, it's, it's definitely, you know, motivation to be able to get it right, no matter what it is you're using. But um, a lot of times, you know, just 
Um, do you have an idea for a storytelling technique uh, that would help come, you know, make like an interview come to life? Uh, we've done a couple, we did a, one thing where we had somebody talking about um, uh, a car accident that they were in. And so we decided, okay, let's reenact the car accident. And the problem is, is unless you really know what you're doing and you've got the right people there to work with, you know, the stunts and stuff like that, it becomes this embarrassing mess, you know? So we just scrubbed <laughs> that whole part of the story just because it didn't work. But, you know, also sometimes, you know, you try things that are kind of outside of your level of experience. I was shooting a musical in um, Florida on Captiva Island. And uh, it was a resort that would had a resort that was just being built. And so for promotional purposes, they let us stay there for free. And as long as we you know, made sure that their name was prominent in the, in the show. And one of the things we had a night sequence that we needed an awful lot of electricity to be able to light was they we had this big ballroom kind of thing. And so the way to be able to get that much electricity was to go down to the breaker panel for the whole resort. And tie in some heavy duty um, wires to be able to feed that all that electricity up to the ballroom and then we could distribute it out to the different lights. I tied into a breaker box a couple of times before but never one quite this big. So I got one alligator clip up into the, the box and then as soon as I took the second one in that was supposed to be the hot side, this blinding flash of sparks and light threw me back up against the wall there and the entire island went dark oh. it was we had we killed all of the electricity for the island so it was you know it was a few hours until we got the electricity back i had to admit yes it was me i did it and, um, i won't do it again oh, you know, right. i've got a licensed electrician to do this but it was one of those things of oh ted knows how to do that you know, so well, I know, and the, the stuff you learn as you go along, you do, and you do some of the work that someone else ordinarily would. That's that's how you learn it. I think um, to, to wrap this up, Ted, can you tell me a little bit about your company now? Uh, maybe some of the projects you are working on, or uh, yeah, the, uh, um, the of the company? yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, we've been in a lot of. I've you know, with my wife, we were in a few different places. Even you know, we tried running it out of our house for a while, and we just I said, no, get this stuff out of here. What's nice about having an office is no matter how hard or long you're working on something, at the end of that, you can close the door, go home, and it's not you know all around you still. Problem, I think, working at home that we discovered was you never stop. You know, it's just always there. Why not keep going? And you know, you need space in your head and in the time that you're living to be able to um, you know, sit back and just sort of let sink in what it is you're doing. Um, but um, so I had an office in Beverly for like 14 years. And that was primarily because I had a lot of clients in Boston. The train station was a five minute walk away from my office. And then the train took less than Very convenient for that. But as the business evolved, um, I needed to get to an airport more than get to a train because I needed to go to New York. I needed to go to LA. I needed to go to you know, Chicago. And so I said, why not, you know, move the office, you know, closer to home. And I was lucky enough about a year and a half ago to find a space that was you know, had been stripped down to the tell us what you need in terms of space and how you want to configure it and we'll build it out for you. So it was one of those lucky things that, you know, all the, again, it's like one of those situations where need and opportunity, you know, kind of, you know, came together at the same time. So now I'm working with a bunch of freelancers, which is really what I've always done. Um, you know, I hire people that are good at what they do and have particular skills that lend themselves more to the kind of projects we're doing. So I've got this, you know, I'm wrapping up this film about blues tourism that, you know, really came out of my first film 50 years ago. What we're doing is we're using pieces of the original film and then intercutting it with, you know, the way things are today down there. And uh, we did a test screening for some of these segments uh, at a film festival in Mississippi back in January. It, it, you know, it got really good responses. So I, I felt, okay, this, this is gonna work. Let's finish the thing. So there's that. Um, there was a film that we're working on about female bodybuilders. 
which came from actually my personal trainer at my gym, um, who was a competitor in uh, women's bodybuilding competitions. And so I just started to, you know, meet some of her friends and people that were into the sport. And it was fascinating to me. So I said, okay, let's, let's see where this goes. Um, so we're working on that, probably wrap up shooting by December and then go into editing after that. Um, I'm also working on a film about um, American Jews that want to become part of the Israeli army. And it was, you know, that I had no idea this even existed until someone told me about it. And I said, okay, I want to find out more about this. So I've, I've talked to a bunch of people. They've all got fascinating stories. And it's, you know, one of these things that, you know, no one I think has ever explored before. So I like getting into stuff that, you know, doesn't have, you know, a big, you know, history in terms of that topic being dealt with. Um, there are a lot of blues documentaries out there for sure, but I haven't found one that's like a memoir of, you know, the then and now. So in that case, that particular one is, is unique just because of my involvement. Quite frankly, it's, it's the first time that I ever decided to step in front of the camera. You know, for 40 years, I've always been the guy behind the camera, you know, working, you know, to get the people who are in front of the camera looking good. So to be able to, to you know, sort of turn it around on myself has been quite an eye opener, you know, because you start realizing, okay, this isn't so easy. <laughs> you know, not that I ever thought it was, because I really recognize a lot of the people that we've worked with, like Martin Sheen, are, are incredibly talented in being able to sort of convey a genuineness and an informality that is actually very practiced and disciplined, but it comes off as being totally natural. So, you know, I'm not saying I'm any Martin Sheen, but I would love to be able to think that there's a future in my being able to sort of use myself as uh, you know, sort of the guide through exploring some offbeat topics. So who knows where that will go next? But uh, right now I've got you know, several, several of these projects here that I'm really enjoying working on and hopefully we can get somewhere with them. I'm gonna do my homework and hopefully uh, I'll be able to grab you again and we can talk a little bit more in depth about a project or two that you have done. Would that be okay? Sure, yeah, definitely. I could uh, get the clips for you and uh, you know, we could, you know, sort of use those as, you know, little, little vignettes and then spring off and do a discussion from that. Yeah, and I've got to learn how to share screen too because, I, you know, this, this technology is amazing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so by then you'll have learned that. You know? There you go. All right, thank you for taking the time, Ted. I really appreciate it. Well, Rick, really, I appreciate this. So uh, when will this be appearing? All right, let me just end the recording.